Our gracious Father in heaven, as we come before you once again this morning on bended knee, we earnestly plead for the quickening power of thy Holy Spirit. Father, we need to be awakened to a realization of our true condition and our need of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us to will and to do of thine own good pleasure. We need thy Holy Spirit, Father, during the coming hour to guide us into all truth. As Jesus said, the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so, Father, we pray that you would do that here, do that for us here this morning. We pray and we thank you in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. It's nice to be back here. My wife and I were talking, and this seems more like home to us. We spent three months here uh, the last trimester uh, than our home does. So uh, uh, it's really good to be back here again. And uh, one is I feel close to a lot of the people here. They're like family to me. And uh, it's, it's really good to be able to study with people who are of like minds. But we're asking God, of course, to bring us even closer together by coming close to Him. And, uh, you know, it's really my prayer that is uh, we study together this week that God has been working in each of our lives, in individual lives, in our personal study, we've, I feel like I've been studying a piece of the puzzle, just one small piece of the puzzle. And, but when I come together with others, I see how the things that I've studied have importance. And uh, I have a little saying that says, unity is an individual work. Uh, and that individual work is our unity with Christ. And that brings us close together. Now, I'm going to be presenting on the structure of prophetic chronology, and I'm going to be doing three lectures, one today, one tomorrow, one Wednesday in, in the early evening. And uh, the one that I'm doing today is dealing with the 430 years, and it's dealing with the story of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the entry and, and the period of the sojourning of the children of Israel. Uh, the one that I'm going to do tomorrow is dealing with the chronology of Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And then the one I'm going to be doing on Wednesday is going to deal with Ezekiel uh, chapter 4, the prophecy of the 390 and the 40 years. And in that one, I'm going to tie together as well all of the things that I've talked about today and tomorrow. Um, now, normally, uh, I would present this if I was doing it in a rational way. Uh, in six or seven lectures, <clears throat> not in three, uh, I did happen to do it all in one Bible study on Saturday night, uh, all three lectures, sort of. Um, but uh, this is something that you're going to have to study out for yourself. So the notes that I have, I'm not really following them meticulously, um, <clears throat> but the notes are important for your personal study and anybody watching uh, this video. Uh, it's important that you spend time going through it. So I'm going to be doing this in, in a cursory fashion, though I'm going to stop and focus on certain parts, uh, what I consider the important parts of what I'm talking about. So one of the things that we're dealing with in the structure of prophetic chronology, the structure of, because chronology is prophetic. God's chronology in God's word is not just happenstance. It's not just arbitrary dates. They are specifically designed by God, and they have meaning and purpose. They're like DNA, and they tell us something um, about what God is doing in, in these periods of time in the Bible. And we're going to see in this first lecture, just dealing with uh, the 430 years, uh, the structure, some of the basic structure. Now, I'm going to be dealing with the 430 years, and then I'm also going to deal with the transition periods in there. And some of the material I got, I'd studied it out on my own and then I read a paper by Johannes Koletsky 
and he had done much the same work, but he brought out some points that I'd never considered. Uh, but specifically, we want to understand not just the structure, because the structure is very important, but how that structure relates uh, to our time and the time that we're in, and of course the reform lines. Now that's not a specialty of mine. I'm really good with numbers and dates and things that are, are, are easy for me to verify and that I don't have to speculate on. When I have to guess at something, I'm not as good at it. I, I can do it, but I believe that God has, has actually, we don't have to guess. He, is, he has designed these things in such a way that we can see things that, uh, uh, as we put them all together. So hopefully I can do some justice with this as we go through this material. Now, the first thing I want to read to you is um, Genesis chapter 15. So let's go there. Now I did do a presentation on this back in uh, July. And I was, um, at that time, not understanding everything that I understand now, but uh, some of the important things are in that if you go back and look at that from uh, the Lambert uh, uh, Community Fellowship uh, videos. Um, in Genesis 15, we have, this is the confirmation of the covenant that God gives to Abraham. And... Uh, Let's look at verse 7. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds divided he not. Now there's lots in this and I'm not going to be able to go through it like I did in the past, but we have these animals are divided into half. And Abram, according to Ellen White, he walks between these carcasses and then he chases away the birds throughout the day and in the evening he falls into a deep sleep and then he sees God passing through these in the form of a, uh, a burning lamp and a smoking furnace. So if we look at this, uh, in verse 17, and it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking lamp and a burning, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Now, Ellen White comments on these passages, and uh, this is from. Uh, Patriarchs and Pro Prophets, page 136 and 137. And I'm going to, it's in the notes, but I'm going to start reading in the second paragraph. It says, Still, the Patriarch begged for some visible token as a confirmation of his faith and as an evidence to after generations that God's gracious purposes toward them would be accomplished. Now, when we look at this, it's a visible token. Now, we are not there. Abram saw this happen, but it, he, he wanted a visible token for after generations. And this is a visible token for after generations, as we're going to see. Um, now, of course, the after generations immediately following are the four generations that lead into Egypt, as we'll see, and then the four generations that come out of Egypt. But are we also an after generation? Is this a visible token for us? Can we see it? We're not there, but we can see it, um, what's happening. So uh, she says, talks about Abraham sacrificing this heifer, the she-goat, and so forth. And uh, she says further down at the end of that paragraph, the plan of redemption was here open to him in the death of Christ, the great sacrifice, and his coming in glory. Abraham saw also the earth restored to its Eden beauty to be given him for an everlasting possession as the final and complete fulfillment of the promise. So this smoking lamp, it says in the next part, and a burning, the smoking furnace and a burning lamp are symbols of the divine presence past and that passed between the severed victims. So 
when we have these animals divided in half, now there's a whole study dealing with this, which I'm not going to go into, uh, but one thing that we do see is that these represent a mirror. And we're going to see that this mirror was fulfilled in the history of Jacob and Joseph. So it, it's, it's very, very important. So in order to see this, we need to look at the chronology. Now, I spent a lot of time studying these things and working them out, but in Patriarchs and Prophets, in the appendix, uh, a lot of the, the, the chronology is already given there for us. Now this, of course, Alan White didn't write the appendix, uh, but it's well-established chronology. It's always good, though, to work these things out on your own. You know, you can read a book, somebody writes a book on chronology and you read it and you say, okay, it makes sense. But you need to check and verify that what somebody's saying is true. But this is something that other people have said and you, you can spend time doing it. I've given the verses to show this as well. Um, so this is on page 759 of Patriarchs and Prophets. It's called Note 3, referencing page two, 282. And it says, in Genesis 15, 13, we read that the Lord said to Abraham, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that, was, that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. The text raises the questions whether the 400 years refers to the time of affliction, or sojourning, or both, and what the relation of the 430 years is to the 430 years in Exodus 12, 40, 41, and Galatians 3, verse 16 and 17. So in uh, Exodus uh, 12, 40 and 41, uh, we have a, a, uh, a passage there that we need to look at. So if you want to turn there. And it says, now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. And in Galatians chapter 3, if you want to go there, uh, verse 16 and 17, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made, and he saith not into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant which was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul, that it should make the promise of none effect. So Paul is saying here that the law is 430 years after the confirmation of the covenant, the giving, uh, the, the covenant, which was confirmed by God. So, this has always been this debate, or you run into it, uh, you know, some people believe that there's 400 years that they're in Egypt, uh, but as we go on and read here, it says, um, the statement in Exodus 12:40 that the sojourning of the children of e e Israel, who dwelt in Egypt, was 430 years, gives the impression that the Israelites from Jacob's entry into Egypt to the Exodus actually spent 430 years in the country of the Nile. That this impression cannot be correct is obvious from Paul's inspired interpretation of Galatians 3, verse 16 and 17, where the 430 years are said to cover the period beginning when God made a covenant with Abraham until the law was promulgated at Sinai. Paul seems to refer to the first promise made by God to Abraham when he was called to leave Haran, and that's in Genesis 12, verse 1 to 3. At that time, the 430 years began. When Abram was 75 years old, at that time he was 75 years old, while the 400 years of the prophecy of Genesis 15, 13, since they end at the same time as the 430 years, um, began 30 years later when Abram was 105 years old and his son Isaac, five years old. At that time, Ishmael, who was born after the flesh, persecuted him, Isaac, that was born after the spirit. And that's in Galatians 4.29 and Genesis 21, verse 9 to 11. 
beginning the time of affliction of Abram's seed, which intermittently uh, would be continued until the time of the Exodus. So we're, we're looking at what's happening here, and I'm just going to read a little bit uh, where he sums this up. It says, The time from Abram's call to Jacob's entry into Egypt was 215 years, being the total of 25 years lying between Abram's call and the birth of Isaac, and 60 years lying between Isaac's birth and Jacob's birth, that's in Genesis 25, 26, and the age of Jacob at the time of his migration into Egypt, Genesis 47, 9. This leaves the remaining 215 years of the 430 as the actual time the Hebrews spent in Egypt. So if we look at this here on this chart, this is 430 years, and it goes from Abram leaving Haran, and it ends at the Exodus, which is 1533 BC, and it's divided in the middle when Jacob, when he's 130 years old, enters Egypt. So we have 25 years here, 60 years here, and 130 years here. And you add those together, they're 215 years. So that means this period here is 215 years, which means this period here is also 215 years. And so we see that in this structure, we see that dividing of those animals, the carcasses, is a symbol that is repeated in this history. It's a visible token for after, after, after generations. Right? And we're going to see that this structure exists again and again. So it's very, very simple once you look at it, uh, that this period of the sojourning of the children of Israel has a symbolic significance relating to this mirror. And one of the things we see is that it's not just dividing something, uh, it's, not just, it's not just a mathematical division, but it's dividing a structural division. This is the time in Canaan, and this is the time in Egypt. And of course, we see this type of structure again and again as we study prophetic chronology. So that went a little quicker than I thought, but uh, hopefully that part, that part of it uh, makes sense. And you can go through, and I have in my notes, uh, lots of information dealing with that. Now, one of the things I just want to touch on is the date of the Exodus. Now, this was not something that was... Uh, uh, that easily came, I came by this date. It's a lot of work, which I don't have time to show here. But I do have a chart dealing with the 400 years of affliction and Ellen White's statements uh, regarding these spans of time, uh, periods of 400 years. And um, I'm quite convinced that if you, and this isn't in the notes, but if you look at 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, And uh, at someday I'm going to do a whole thing dealing with the period of the judges. Uh, but uh, in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. And... So that means the Exodus happened 480 years prior to that event. So if we can find when Solomon laid the foundation of the temple, we then know the date of the Exodus. And I just confirmed this on Sabbath because I've been spending a whole bunch of time dealing with these calendars and dealing with the weekly sabbatical cycle and working out the, the Passover, the, the original Exodus Passover and the timeline and... Uh, I'm 100% certain uh, of that timeline now. Now, just because I'm 100% certain doesn't mean I'm 100% correct. That just means I'm convinced myself that much. But uh, it, you need to study it out. And so I'm going to be pre presenting material to show this 
the timeline of the Exodus and how it works. But I know which days of the week everything happened on. You know, so I can confirm that in 1533 BC uh, that the days of the week work correctly with the Passover timeline that I had worked out. And, and there's a lot more to it. It's not just that. So, but that's kind of an aside. Uh, though I am going to bring a connection here between these dates a little bit later as I deal with the next part. So that's dealing with that basic structure. And of course, in your book, you'll see that we, we have this 430 years divided into two periods of 215. We also know that the 2520 for Israel is divided into two periods of 1260 years. 1260 years for paganism and 1260 years for papalism. And we're going to look at that in a bit more detail as we look at the transition from the first group of 215 years to the second group because that structure is repeated in that uh, two 1260s, which is really, really, really fascinating. And that's the thing that Johannes Koletsky brought out, uh, though that was back in 2010, April 2010, he did that paper, and, which is interesting because he, he figured this stuff out before I did. Um, and figured out some things I didn't, and I figured out some things he didn't. But um, that's because we have some light that we didn't have back in 2010. Um, we also know that there is uh, uh, other periods, and I have there a period of 140 years. That's from Manasseh to Daniel's captivity, from Daniel's captivity to Cyrus. And, uh, uh, and those are periods of 70 years and 70 years. So this chiastric structure or prophetic mirror is extremely important in understanding uh, prophetic chronology. So now we're going to look at the line of Joseph. So this one's going to take a little bit more time to look at. And I'm going to try to go through it a little more slowly because it is a little uh, more dense of a study. And we also have things about this study that surprised me as I started to look at this chronology. So let's first look at Genesis 41, verse 46. Um, and Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. So. One thing we know as we, we're going to look at a bunch of different uh, dates and ages and timelines within this is that we have, um, we have actually a really detailed chronology here of the story of Joseph and Jacob and Abraham and Isaac, which is, is kind of unusual in a way um, because there's lots in the Bible where they don't give us some very specific things. We can't figure out things to the year, but here we can. And the Bible is consistent, and the spirit of prophecy is consistent. So I've drawn up here the first 215 years. And I've read a text that says, Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh. And we need to place this on this, this line. So we're going to have to take look at some things. Now, I, I hear, I, I did some math, uh, I put Jacob was 130 when he entered the land of Egypt, right? So we have Jacob here as 130 years old, and this is, this is the transition point. This is where the two, 250, there's 215 on this side, 215 on this side. So this is Canaan, and this is Egypt. Okay, so that's our transition point. So it's a transition point here. Right? Does that make sense? Okay, so, you know, I could draw the, you know, that's that point right there. It's the two, two halves. So hopefully that's clear. And now Jacob came after there was two years of famine. And we can find this. Uh, so I'm kind of... I'm not going through the story chronologically, if that's okay. We're going to kind of, we should know the story. Uh, but we're going to look at these different texts. So we're going to do the math, and we'll kind of go back and forth and try to understand it. Um, but this is in, 
Genesis 45, verse 6. And I have tried presenting it chronologically, and it's actually easier doing it this way, at least for me. In Genesis 45, verse 6, it says, For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. So, that means we know that this period here is a period of seven years. And that there's two years here and five years here. Okay? And that means we also have another period of seven years uh, that precedes that. So since this is the period of famine, this is the period of plenty here. And we know then that here, Joseph is 30 years old. So that should be clear. So Joseph is 30 years old there. So that means uh, Joseph was 39 years old when Jacob came into Egypt. When, Joseph, when Jacob was 130, Joseph was 39. And so we, you know, we could put Jacob's age all along here. Um, now we also have, uh, so that means when Jacob was, uh, when Joseph was 30, Jacob would have been how old? You take nine off of 30, so we would say Jacob here is 121. Okay. So how old would Jacob have been when Joseph was born? So Jacob here is 91 when Joseph is born. Now we also have two other years of, of or two other periods of seven years. This here is for Leah and this is for Rachel. So these two periods of seven years are like that. And they make up a period of 14 years altogether. Just like these two together are also a period of 14 years. So I hope I'm not going too fast. Now, so one of the things we see that, that happens here is Jacob is how old when he begins working for Laban, beginning his seven years of labor? He's 77 years old. And how many years does he work for Leah? And then for Rachel. So he's 77 and then he works seven years and seven years, which is, which is interesting. I, I like these kinds of structures. Uh, but he's pretty old. You know, that's, we don't get that impression when we read Uncle Arthur's Bible story books. Um, <laughs> You know, maybe because of the pictures of how young he looks. But, you know, I raised seven children. That's why I refer to those. Um, which is also seven, yes. Uh, but one of the things I found out that I didn't know is that Jacob marries Leah and Rachel at the same time. That is, he marries Leah, he's deceived, and then he, he has to work another seven years for Rachel, but he does not marry Rachel at the end of that seven years. He marries her at the beginning of that seven years. And we know this because when you look at the births of the children, uh, all those children were born in that seven year period, except for Benjamin who was born about 12 years after Joseph. And um, there's this fight between the, the, you know, the, Leah and Rachel because Leah has some kids and then she can't have kids and then she gets her, her uh, you know, handmade, right, and all these different things go on. And so that happens in this short period of time. And I do have in the appendix of all my notes, I believe I put them in here. I might not have. No, I didn't put it in here. Oh, yeah, it is. It's on the page 126. 
the birth dates of all the different children and, uh, of, of Jacob. So how old is Jacob when he marries Leah and Rachel? He's 84 years old. Now how many children does he have? Well, he has 12 sons, right? Now he has 11 in that period. He does have Dinah in that period, so he actually has 12 children that we have listed in that seven years. But he serves periods of seven years, and 12 is the number of the covenant. And seven times 12 is 84. This is right here in the top of the 1843 chart, in the top right corner. Seven times 12 equals 84. And this shows up again and again in prophetic chronology, this structure. So it's not just a, a random thing that he's 84 years old when he marries two women. Right? There is symbolism there that we could look at, which I don't have time to look at, but there's, there's symbolism there. And we see that, of course, you know, one is the woman that he loves, and one's the woman, you know, well, he, the Bible says he doesn't love. Uh, you know, so, so there is symbolism in there, but we see that dividing happening as well. So just like we see Canaan and Egypt, we see Leah and Rachel, we see plenty and famine, and these periods of 14 years are divided into periods of seven years. Now, some of the things I, I haven't dealt with yet that we're going to look at has to do with uh, the age of Joseph at these different events. So, when Joseph was sold into slavery, um, I've got to find the statement here. Okay, it's in Genesis 37, verse 2. I believe that's... It says, uh, these are the generations of Jacob, jo Jacob. Joseph being 17 years old was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad, lad was the son of Bilhah, and with the sons... With, the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah and his father's wives. Right? So Joseph is 17 years old, and Joseph has two dreams. So since Joseph was born here, we're going to put the 17. So here Joseph is 17, right? Because here Joseph is born. There's 17 years from his birth uh, to the time he's 17. And when he's 17 years old, he has two dreams. Now, we're very familiar with these dreams. So these dreams are of the sheaves uh, that bow down to him and of the stars and the sun and the moon that bow down to him. And when he uh, interprets these dreams to his brothers, they become jealous. So we all know this story. Uh, of the jealousy of Joseph's brothers and why they sold him into slavery. Now, they did that in the same year. So there's other ways that we can show this. Um, so one is we can look at this statement from Signs of the Times, January 22, 1880. That, signs of the time. Yeah, Signs of the Times, January 22, 1880. Jacob's sons came with the crowd of buyers to purchase corn of Joseph, and they bowed down themselves before him with their faces to the earth. He knew them at once, but they failed to recognize him. There was indeed little semblance between the mighty governor of Egypt and the stripling whom, 22 years previous, they had sold to the Ishmaelites. As he saw his brethren stooping and making their obeisance, his dreams came back to his memory, and the scenes of the past rose up vividly before him. His keen eye again surveyed the group before him, and he saw that Benjamin was missing, etc. The main thing is that this is at this point here. So at this point here, 
It's been 22 years since his brothers sold him. So that means if we go back 22 years, because here he's 39, right? So Joseph is 39 here. So if we go back 22 years, we'll find that this is when he has his dreams. So here he has a dream. So there's the two dreams. of Joseph. And those two dreams are then fulfilled 22 years later. Now we can see here we got uh, two, seven years here, and then we would have here altogether 13 years from the time he's 17 to the time he's 30. But we also have an important point right here. So we're going to look at this. The butler and the baker have two dreams. Well, they each have one dream, but together they have two dreams. And so to find this, and we are familiar with this, but to look at it a little bit more in detail, uh, let's look at Genesis chapter 40. So I'm not moving too fast, hopefully. And it's starting to, the board's starting to look a little crowded. But you do have charts that you can look at. Um, but it's in Genesis chapter 40, it says, And it came to pass after these things, uh, chapter 40, verse 1, that the butler and the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And the pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them in ward in the house of the captain of the guard into prison in the place where Joseph was bound. We've actually done studies on this dealing with uh, these, these as reform lines. Um, we're not going to do that at this point. But what we do want to notice is that uh, these, these dreams, and it starts uh, in verse 9, the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and, he, and said to him, in my dream, behold, a vine was before me, and in the vine were three branches. And it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup unto Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast butler. And, of course, uh, we know that the baker also had a dream. Uh, it says when the, in verse 16, When the chief baker saw the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my, my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head, and on the uppermost basket there was all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon mine head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof, the three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thy head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the bird shall eat thy flesh from off thee. So, in the dream of the butler and baker then, uh, and I did this here. Yeah, so this is, I just, okay, we got this here. So we got 17, I just don't have... It's kind of crowded, right? But from uh, this period to here is 17 years, and here we have 11 years, because this is 13 years. So it's just, it's not in proportion. Uh, so the dream of the butler and baker happens uh, halfway between this period here of Joseph's um, dream, Joseph's two dreams, and the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams. So I'm just going to draw this out. I'm going to draw this out over here, just so it's a little clearer. We have Joseph's two dreams. And we have these two dreams fulfilled. And in the middle of that, right here, we have two dreams of the butler and the baker. So this is a period of 11 years, and this is a period of 11 years. 
And Ellen White says that this is a period of 22 years, which it is. And so again, we have a prophetic mirror. Right? Now, it is interesting, what happens in the middle of this 11 years? With the, we have a separation, right? But we also have somebody being hung on a tree, which, of course, in this case is the baker. But we do have, you know, in a sense, a cross there dividing it. Not that the, you know, we, some people may misunderstand that and seem, we, you know, we got some kind of... Uh, yeah, sacrifice, but it's not a sacrifice, but it is a symbol. Being hung upon a tree, cursed is he that's hung upon a tree, right? And we know that in Christ's covenant week, he's crucified in the midst of two periods of 1260 years. So the fact that, the, that that happens in the middle of these two, these two periods of 11 years, this period of 22 years, I think is significant. So we see these symbols again and again being used, uh, these, these mirrors. Now, one of the things we look at here in this, on this side is we see Canaan and Egypt. What we're seeing here in this story of Joseph is the transition from Canaan to Egypt of God's people. And so we're going to look at this in a little bit more detail. So I'm just going to erase this. Erase some of this stuff I don't need. Erase this. Okay. So, we now have 17 years. Jacob, Joseph is born, and Jacob is with his family with Joseph. So we have Joseph and Jacob together. That's the family is in Canaan. And that's for 17 years. And then we have 22 years where that family is separated. So this period of 22 years here is a transition. And it's at the end of this 22 years that uh, they are once again united for a period of 17 years. Now, I didn't deal with this part of it, so we're going to look at some of these verses um, dealing with the age of Jacob. Now, we know Jacob was 130 years old uh, when he came there, and that's in uh, Genesis 47, verse 8 and 9. So let's go there. Because we do have time to prove these things, but there's still some more points I want to bring out as well. And uh, in verse 8, it says, And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? And in verse 9, Jacob says, he's, Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have, have the days of the years of my life being. So, he thinks he didn't live very long, but he lived to be 130 at that point. And uh, we also find out uh, that he lived to be, uh, in Genesis 47, 28, it says, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the whole age of Jacob was 147 years. So I have that there. Jacob is 147 when he dies. So that means he lived in Egypt for 17 years with his family. So here, Joseph and Jacob are together again. So they are united. And this transition from Canaan uh, to Egypt is complete. Now, there are some things that we may notice. Um, one is, how old is Joseph when he stands before Pharaoh? 30 years old. And it's followed by a period of seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. So I'm going to draw this out. So we have 30 years that happens, and then we get seven years of plenty 
and then that's divided, right? So this is actually a hundred. This is actually 14 years altogether. These two periods, and then we have famine, and then we have two years and five years. And we could ask the question, why is this structure here? Why does God do this? Now, Joseph is a type of Christ. How old was Jesus when he began his ministry? Okay, so Jesus here. So this is Joseph. Now we got Jesus. And he also, 30 years from his birth, and then he has seven years of his ministry. Would we say that the seven years of Christ is a time of plenty? Because can it parallel the seven years of plenty? Right, it can, because Christ was ministering to God's people. He was confirming the covenant, which is the whole point of the story of Jacob and Joseph has to deal with the covenant. And he's confirming the covenant with many for one week, for, for seven years. Now his is divided uh, as well. So we know that his has the cross that divides two periods of three and a half years, right, from 27 to 34. But he's also followed by a period of seven years. But that period of seven years is not literal years. So if we go from 34 AD to 538, and some people may remember this from two years ago. I doubt it, though. Um, there's a period of 504 years. This is the period that pagan Rome, or paganism, continues to scatter God's people. And then in 538, papalism begins to trample down God's people. So we have a period of 1260 years. So this is a period of two years and five years. If we go 252 times two, that equals 504 years. And 252 times five equals 1260 years. I'll let, let that sink in a little bit. Some people don't like numbers so much. Um, now, of course, 252 is 2 times 126. It's also 1 tenth of 2520. Now, I noticed this uh, about uh, two years ago, and I presented it. But I didn't really understand the total significance of it. Maybe I still don't. Uh, but one is we see that there is a structure there. That means that 34 AD, when probation closes for the Jewish nation, and the gospel then goes to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are persecuted for a period that is uh, a, a proportion or a ratio of this period where they're persecuted by papalism, right? So that means that these dates are not just arbitrary. The fact that that exists is, is quite interesting. Now I'm going to uh, erase this part. Okay. It, it, you should have diagrams of this somewhat in your book, in your notes. So, so we know that this period here, 538, is connected to a date back here. So I'm going to erase just this part. So you got that part. And this whole period then is a period of 1764 years, right? Because I'm just adding 1260 plus 504, right? And this is then also, just, just to be really clear, it's 7 times 252. Right? Now, if I go back from this date, we know that 723 BC is back here. Um, and that's Hoshea's captivity two years before the destruction of Samaria. And that marks the beginning of the 2520 that ends. So this is a period of 1260 years from here to here. So 
So I didn't do that in proportion, but yeah, okay. Pardon me, this isn't 1260. This is 504. We have to subtract that. So what's 1260 minus 504? Anybody quick at math? That would be, uh, yeah, so 756, right, which actually is really important, and I should have remembered that. And then we have uh, another period. So if we go back from here, 1,764 years, where would we come back to? So that it, what I'm doing is I'm taking this, and I'm saying, since I can go 7 times 252 from this period to this period, if I go back, what date would I come to here? Right? This is going to also be a period of, of 7 times 252. So we have 34 AD. We would just take 33 off of this, and we'd come to 1731 BC. Now, so I had worked out this chronology before I recognized this, this period of time. I'll draw it here, I guess. 1731 BC. And where this brings us to is right here, 1731 BC. Yeah, the death of Jacob. So that means that ties this, this prophecy here, which this is a symbol of, uh, a fractal of, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a type as well, so it's a fractal, it's a type, is connected by the larger picture back to this date when Jacob ends. When this prophetic mirror ends, the 1711, 11, 17, and there's 12 years again that he's after the famine ends, that he's still in, in Egypt before he dies. It's tied together by this, this span. Okay. Now, this is structure. And I know some of the people are looking at me puzzled. You're going to have to spend time to look at it and look at the math. But I'd already figured out this chronology before. right? Based upon understanding the period of the Exodus, you know, this would be... Uh, 1748 BC, right? So he dies 17 years later. That's 1731 BC, right? You just take 17 off of that, right? And so we we can find out all these dates. Uh, you know, Abram. I think it's 1963 BC, and and so forth. You know that you can. They're all written down in the book. Yeah. Yes, the exodus of Egypt is a type of 1798. Yeah. No, we, we, there are so many different things that we can glean as we go through and look at chronology. Now, of course, some of these things, um, you know, we're not going to necessarily understand them, or we're not at least going to remember them. We need to understand how they work, and we need to understand that there is this structure and this connection. But there is something that's much more important, and I only have a few minutes left to show this. What we're looking at, so I have all this structure, and this structure is important. Um, we, have, we have predictions, so we have Joseph's two dreams, and I probably should do this in another color. Let's do it this way. So we got a prediction, and we have, we'll call this prediction one, and we have a fulfillment over here, prediction two, or, or fulfillment one, pardon me, I'm ahead of myself, fulfillment one. And then we also have the dreams of the butler and baker. There's a prediction and a fulfillment that happen roughly at the same time. And then we also have Pharaoh's two dreams, which I didn't mention, but I hinted at. So Pharaoh has two dreams. And these two dreams are fulfilled over a period of, of 14 years. We also have periods of seven years and seven years. So there's structure there. 
But there's also these predictions and fulfillments. And these are important, as we're going to see when we get into Ezekiel. And when we look at our time, when we look at Millerite history, when we look at uh, these prophecies and their fulfillments, that they're tied together. So Joseph has two dreams. In order for this dream to be fulfilled, first the dreams of the butler and baker have to be given and they have to be fulfilled. Because otherwise he doesn't end up before Pharaoh when he's 30 year, years old. And then he has to interpret Pharaoh's dreams. Right? And those dreams have to be fulfilled in order for, again, his original dreams to be fulfilled. So those, those predictions and fulfillment are all interlocked together. Yeah, Joseph's original dreams, pardon me. So Joseph's original dreams, they have to have the dreams of the butler and the baker and the dreams of the pharaoh interpreted by Joseph and fulfilled in order for Joseph's to have his original dreams fulfilled. Yes, and G Jacob has to come from Canaan to Egypt. I kind of get excited when I, when I look at these things, because every time I th think about them, there's more than I can take in. And, and so we could spend a lot of time, and you can spend a lot of time studying this and thinking about it and noticing things that you know, are just on the fringe of my vision, but, you, that, but that for you are going to be valuable. And one of the things I always try to emphasize when I do these things is that these things aren't given to tickle our intellect. They are given to give us faith in God's word. And as we exercise this faith, God will give us more light. And as he gives us more light, we need to exercise more faith. And then he gives us more light. And so God is pouring out light upon his people. All of us are going to be finding these things. And those things that we individually find, other people don't necessarily need to understand all of them. But they do, but we do need to understand them for ourselves because they are going to be the things that we hold on to. Those are going to be those, those ropes, those lines that are let down as we go along that narrow path that go into this big rope, all those cords that are being let down. And we need those things, but we need especially the ones that we find for ourselves. Those are going to be the ones that really initially guide us. And as we gather together all these cords, uh, we will develop a faith that can carry us across that abyss Amen. into God's heavenly kingdom. Um, just one more thing of interest. I almost don't want to do it, but uh, uh, it'll be really short. When we look at this, this period, one is, I notice that there is four periods of seven years. There is two periods, if we look at these as periods of 14 years, two of them. And there's also a period of 22 years, one period of 22 years. Now, if we look at the story of the Babylonian captivity, Um, and I'm just going to draw this out really quickly, from 677 B.C. to 457 B.C., there are there's a period of 70 years from Manasseh to the captivity. There's a period of 70 years to Cyrus' accession to the throne. And that's a period of 140 years. We also have uh, 140 years from here to here from Jehoiachin's captivity. Uh, and these are tied together, the beginning and the end, symbolically. And there's also another period of 70 years for the temple. But there's also 70 years for Babylon itself. So Babylon has a period of 70 years, which starts two years before the period of the Babylonian captivity itself. And this is a period of 220 years. So that means there is four periods of 70 years two periods of 140 years and one period of 220 years in the period of the Babylonian captivity. So the structure that happens here in this story of jo Jacob and Joseph is repeated in the Babylonian captivity. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's very interesting things that we see in, in God's word as we, we start to look at this. 
And this is just, this is just scratching the surface. surface. We haven't really dug deep yet, but we are going to, you know, as God leads us and as he allows, as we allow him uh, to work in our lives. So I know people are going to have questions at some point. You know, you can talk to me personally, but you need to study this out. And it looks like a mess, but it says, uh, Ellen White says about Ezekiel's wheel within a wheel, yeah. that it appears to be in confusion, but there's perfect order. And uh, my charts in the book are a little neater, but there still is so much to see. And so God is interlocking these truths together. In, and as again, as I said, you know, there's all these pieces of the puzzle. This is just one piece of the puzzle. But God is, is helping each of us as we study to see those other pieces of the puzzle. And I really am praying and I believe that God is going to bring the pieces of the puzzle together at this camp meeting. But in order for him to do that, we have to do something. One of the things that I've had to do that is very, very hard is I've had to admit that I'm wrong on more than one occasion. And I've fought against some of these things for a long time as I would study them, but I would eventually yield. Usually when I'd run into a brick wall, I would have to give up and I would just say, God, you know, I must be wrong. Nothing works. Doesn't make any sense. And then God would either give me a dream or he would tell me to read a verse in the Bible and that would answer and unlock everything. And so we have to get to that point in our experience where we are going to be directed by God and we have to set aside our, our preconceived notions. And I'm going to show that in tomorrow's lecture, dealing with the chronology of Judah or, or Jeremiah and um, Ezekiel and some of the things dealing with the chronology of the kings of Judah and Israel and the things that I've had to unlearn in order to understand God's word. So it's my prayer that God can help each of us to do that. And let us now close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are amazed at your word. Even though we can't fully understand everything that we read and hear and see, we can see your hand in the lives of the patriarchs, in the history, in the structure of prophetic chronology. We can also see your hand, Lord, working in our personal lives as we have walked down that path, as we have yielded our lives to you. We have seen, Lord, that you have, even though it may at first appear confusion and disorder, uh, we can see as we obey you the perfect order and plan that you have for our lives. And Lord, we are standing on the verge of momentous events and we are unprepared. We have not spent the time that we should have in studying your word. We have wasted precious time. And you have held that door of probation open, but it's soon to close. And I pray for each person here, Lord, because I know that they're in the same shape that I'm in. We are completely undone. There is nothing that we can do apart from you. And we need you in our lives in a powerful way. We need the convicting power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to convict us of sin, to work out righteousness, that we can stand before you in judgment, that we can vindicate your character upon the earth. Be with us throughout these meetings. Help each of us to have a mind and a heart uh, that is contemplating these important things that the world can be pushed out, um, not just here at this camp meeting, but in our lives completely. We give our lives to you, Lord. We ask again uh, for your spirit to be our teacher, to be our guide. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.